Thank you. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dries Kronje. Um, amongst my family and friends, I'm known for that guy. I'm famous for being that guy um, who uses a Slack bot to switch his bright light on. Nevertheless, today I'm here to share with you all some of my experiences and my passion for deep learning. Hopefully demonstrating that if you ignore all the hype currently in the media, that some truly amazing things can be, can be achieved with um, deep learning. Um, to start, I'm going to try and tickle your fancy by showing you a few examples of, of what deep learning can achieve. Um, here we you see a, a Tesla in autopilot mode, or as my wife would understand, a self-driving car. Um, deep learning is used for segmentation and classification of the various video feeds that come in. Here we see um, Lisa Doll being beaten by AlphaGo in the ancient Chinese board game Go. Uh, for humanity, this was painful to watch. For AI, it was a huge leap forward. Um, AlphaGo used the combination of reinforcement learning and Monte Carlo tree search. Here we see deep learning used for image, sec uh, image um, annotation. A black and white dog jumps over a bar. It's not bad. Not bad for a deep learning model. And for real-time translation, crossing the language barrier. And my absolute favorite, deep learning used for style transfer. Okay, so all the previous examples have, have demonstrated that AI can be effectively used in achieving tasks. <laughs> Sorry. Um, okay, so that AI can be effectively used in achieving tasks that once we believed only humans are capable of. However, <laughs> this example shows that AI is actually still a long, long way away from um, general human intelligence. A woman holding a teddy bear in front of a mirror, really? <laughs> Okay, so what is deep learning? Please take a moment um, to have a read through how Francois Choli from, um, from Google describes deep learning. Okay, in the slides to follow, I will illustrate to you the component parts of, of deep learning. Deep learning is a neural network with many um, hidden layers. Your, one, your outputs from your one layer feeds as in, uh, feed into the next layer. That's essentially what a deep learning neural network is. But for a more visual, um, a more visual explanation, let's imagine deep learning as a, as a magic box. And we are standing on top of a mountain where our error is, is really high. We're trying to get to the bottom of the mountain where our error is low. The going down the mountain is, is, the, is the learning part. And the idea is not to race down a mountain because you're going to fall, or no, no, um, to proceed down a mountain slowly because you're never going to get there. The idea is to go down smoothly and quickly as possible. We, we proceed down the mountain by iteratively passing training samples through the magic box and calculating the error at the end there. Um, with every iteration, working our way back through, through the um, magic box, we calculate the slope or, or, um, or how much each neuron has contributed to the error. And accordingly, we change the weights. And we do this bit by bit in order to proceed down the mountain as quickly and as smoothly as possible. If we are continuously doing this, we are learning. This process is called backpropagation. And it's a technique that has played a big role in the success of deep learning. The ImageNet competition is the World Cup for computer vision. The competition is based on how well a model can classify images across a thousand categories. The training set consists of 1.2 million images and is freely available for download uh, in the public domain. For the competition, an unseen test set is passed through the um, trained models, and the top five error rate is measured for each team. Before 2012, feature engineering won the competition each year. 
AlexNet, a deep learning neural network, changed the game in 2012 by scoring a top five error rate of 15.4%. The next best team came in at 26.6%. That is like winning the World Cup 8-0. And for the interest sake, AlexNet trained on two five, uh, GTX 580 GPUs for six days. Since 2012, the image net competition has been dominated by deep learning. Um, have a look at the big names joining uh, joining later on. Google Lynette won it in 2014. And in 2015, Microsoft ResNet surpassed what is considered to be human accuracy. And with the accuracy being driven down to almost nothing, and the initial problem that was set out being solved, the competition was ran for the very last time this year in 2017. And this was the competition that grabbed the attention of the world. Moving on to a, a more practical aspect of deep learning, let's consider the workings of the convolutional neural network. A convolutional neural network is made, of, made up of various layers, and each layer brings forward an extracted feature set. The first layer of a convolutional neural net um, extracts low-level features, and each layer builds on a previous, extracting more high-level features than the previous. Taking a face recognition uh, model as an example, we see the low-level details as those being of lines, shadows, and contrast. And by the second layer, we can make out a nose or an ear or a facial, some facial features. And by the, by the third layer, we can actually make out full faces. It's important to note that these are not actual faces, but rather the learned representation of what the face looks like to the deep learning model. Um, this illustration shows a typical convolutional neural network. Um, your mo your a popular model like the VGG 16 net will have 16 layers. So for illustration purposes, I've got two layers. Um, drilling down into each layer, we can see that a, a typical convolutional neural network is, um, a layer is made up of convolutions, activations, and, and pooling. So convolution, the function of the convolution step is to slide over the image and extract features. By representing an image as zeros or ones, um, we get some, something similar to the green image. And the orange image, uh, the orange being the convolution that is slide over the image. The pink image is the extracted feature map. This slide shows edge detection as an example of a convolution being applied to an image in the real world. Stride controls how the filter convolves around the input volume. In this example, this, the, the convolution slides by, by one unit and therefore has a stride of one. In this example, the filter moves um, by two units and therefore has a stride of two. Notice how the output volume is now shrunk. Padding adds a border of zeros around your input volume and is used to preserve your, your, um, the volume of your input, well, your input volume. Number two, activations. Um, the rectified linear unit, or the acronym RELU, um, is, uh, introduces non-linearity to your uh, model. It replaces the more traditional sigmoid and tan H um, activations, and it uses a lot less processing power, which is significant in deep learning when you literally work with hundreds of millions of, of um, neurons in a typical deep learning model. The pooling function replaces the output of the net at a certain location with a summary statistic of the nearby um, output. 
This example demonstrates the, the most popular one, the um, uh, max pooling. Uh, max pooling takes the maximum value of values in a rectangle and takes that value forward. Can you see how um, dimensionality is reduced? We, you, sorry, um, we've literally reduced our output volume by 75% by using uh, two by two max pooling, um, by, by using two by two max pooling. Okay. How do we know how many layers to use or what size filters to use? How do we choose the values for stride and for padding? These are not trivial questions and choosing our hyperparameters is more wizardry than that of a science. This is because um, data can vary greatly in size and complexity. Trying to find optimal hyper hyperparameters using heuristic search is, is out of the question because of how long it takes to train your model. We've, we've heard that training the AlexNet model took six days and that's on one single set of hyperparameters. Imagine trying to go through millions of combinations and each time it takes six days to train. It's probably only the, the Googles and Microsofts of the world that can even try and attempt this at the moment. Um, your, your best option is to use your knowledge about the problem and, and guess some parameters and observe the result. Um, based on the result, we tweak the parameters and re we repeat the process until we find parameters um, that work for our model. In summary, um, the combination of layers and each layer consisting of convolutions, activations and pooling translates into a convolutional neural network. Finally, the convolutional neural network feeds into um, fully connected layers, which finally feeds into a softmax layer. Your softmax layer is the convolution, um, is indicates how confident your network is at predicting whether it's a, a cat or a dog. So we have finally built a model. Now let's train the model. In order to train the model, we pass through thousands and thousands of images of cats and dogs, and we measure the error. With every iteration, we make adjustments to the weight in order to drive the error rate down. And we make these adjustments until we've met some stopping criteria. Inference. Um, this is the step that uses your newly trained model and make predictions on unlabeled data. This is your real value add. Uh, once you've reached this stage, you can now build a product or a service around your model. I've used, um, I've used a toy example of cats and dogs, and although I've been able to, to tag friends without typing their names or find amusing images of cats can be fun, um, uh, or might seem trivial, the same technology is quickly advancing to a point where, far, uh, where more far-reaching implications are being realized. Without a doubt, one of the most exciting uh, potential use, uses for deep learning um, is in healthcare. Okay, let's build something. I've chosen um, TensorFlow as, uh, as uh, uh, sorry, for our, uh, for our demo I've chosen TensorFlow. TensorFlow has adopted Python as a first-class citizen, and Python has direct bindings to the TensorFlow execution engine. It runs at exactly the same level as your C++ front-end. So don't let anyone tell you C++ is fast or anything. It's simply not true. Python runs at exactly the same, as exactly the same bindings as your C++ front-end. Um, for for the practical part, I'm going to move over to a Jupyter um, notebook now. Can we all see? Okay. Okay, so I continue the theme with um, cats and dogs. Um, I've chosen cats and dogs, and it's a very popular um, competition on the, on the Kaggle competition um, network. Um, for traditional machine learning, this is a really difficult problem. There's so much overlap in, in, in um, color and pattern and et cetera with um, cats and dogs. But for deep learning, this is actually a very easy problem. And the, 
state-of-the-art models actually reach an accuracy of in the region of 97%. Before we can really get into it, uh, I just want to run quickly through a couple of the of the basics of um, TensorFlow. And one of the first first basics you need to get a grasp of is, is what is a tensor. And TensorFlow is based on on the idea of tensors, and tensor a tensor is basically just a multi-dimensional array. Um, here we see a tensor with a shape of three, and getting more complex, we have we now have a two-dimensional shape of two by three, and this is the sort of shapes we're going to look at today. Um, a two, three, two shape doesn't make sense. It's two by three, and it's and it's two levels deep. This little graph here explains nicely why Python is a first-class citizen, why it's not slow. It's because we, because we built in TensorFlow, you build your computational graph and then you execute it. So the execution part happens in low-level C++ code on your GPU and, the, and there's a feedback that comes back to your Python. So your Python is not actually running your, your um, deep learning training. It's actually done low-level on your GPU itself. Um, let's. We need to import a few dependencies. All the usual suspects are here: Matplotlib, Sky Image, um, NumPy. Yesterday, I've, there was an interesting talk, so I will definitely soon replace all the globs. Did a few helper methods just to tidy things up, and. An important part of deep learning, as with uh, with with um, data science in general, is is actually just the pre-processing of your data. So in our case, we loading data, um, we loading cats and dogs images. I've set it up in a couple of folders, and an important part is to is this part here is is to shape it into a into into vectors that TensorFlow understands. So, so we re we resizing our images into 128, 128, three deep, and TensorFlow will understand that sort of arrangement. Okay, let me load some data for us. This might be there might be some awkward silence now for a few seconds. The full the full data set is about twenty five thousand images, and anyone who wants to get into deep learning, that's a really good way to to get started. There's there's um, so much exploration you can do in deep learning um, using a toy toy set like um, the cats and dogs um, data set. Yes. Yes, that's it's your it's your color channels. Yes. This I promise this was a lot quicker last night when I tried it. Or maybe it just feels long <laughs> when you stand here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm sure my kernel is running. Okay, I'll start um, just explaining a couple of things. Okay, done. It wasn't too bad. Okay, okay. Just to just to show what um, what we've discussed for the shape of the images, we can see it's 128, 128 by three, and then your first the first 4,000 is actually the the number of images that's so going to flow through our graph. Um, labels is very self-explanatory. We've got 4,000 labels, and they literally just ones or zeros, integers. Let's get some insights into our data. Um, it's all yes. The text. I actually don't know how to do that. To control shift plus. There you go. Is is that better? Excellent. Okay, let's get some insights into the data. It's always good to just get a feel for what we're working with. 
Okay. Um, just random images of dogs. We can see some are yellow, black, colored. Some are small. Some actually takes up a small part of the image and not the full image. So there's, there's very few assumptions we can make. Um, so we will have to let the model do its work and extract features. We can quickly have a look at a couple of cat images. Let's just change that. Notice how much overlap there is in color and pattern. Um, okay, so we, we, we talked about convolutions, and convolutional neural networks are about convolutions, and that's about finding, finding features. So if you use the, uh, an image of a building, and, and the building has a lot of horizontal and vertical um, lines, and we're using just a small subset of that image, to just try and understand a little bit more about convolutions. There's the black and white. Um, take special notice of the um, street board on this side when we do the actual convolutions. Okay, so I've set up two convolutions. One, one for vertical and one for horizontal, as can be seen. And we set up a TensorFlow session, building to execute our graph. We set up the session. Now we're looking at the vertical. Okay, so vertical. Notice all the horizontally the image is blurred, but vertically there's actually the features come forward, and this is typically what a convolution does. Now notice the difference when when I run the um, horizontal convolution. Brought out, it's brought out the horizontal part of this um, street board quite nicely. Um, it's always good practice in any computer, in any machine learning project, to to set up a, a validation and a test set. So that's what we'll do here quickly. We've got three thousand images to train with, five hundred in validation, five hundred in test. Um, this is an important little helper method for us because it actually shows what, what we've talked about so far. So we make sure we, we set up padding. And padding same means we try and preserve our input volume. We're using a, a specified number of filters. Default is 32. So we're using 32 of these vertical, horizontal, color, shape, whatever convolutions. And we use the ReLU activation. We use a max pool, a max pool um, layer at the end with a stride of 2x2 two two and the, the size of the kernels are 2x2. Two two. Next in TensorFlow, we set up placeholders. Now, placeholders is kind of difficult to explain. Uh, the only way I can say to you is this is we specify how the data flows through the static graphs. And in our case, we, we're passing it through um, we're passing it through the shape of our image, which is 128 by 128. We don't specify how many because we want to vary the size of our batches. And the shape of our Y is just a single integer value. I have to actually execute these, not to forget. Place all this. And now we build our model. This is a very simple model. It's only got four max pool or convolutional layers. Um, the state of the art models typically has about seven or eight of these. Uh, for our purposes, it will do. We use an atom optimizer. This is, this is how we get down the mountain smoothly and quickly. We use atom. Um, and then, and, and we and we optimize by reducing our loss or our error rate. We initialize TensorFlow, and this is our training. Um, luckily for you, I've done I've trained the model at home, 
and I've saved it. But this is basically training, and all this does is we we break our training set into batches. We pass the batches through the model. We train the, and we optimize using Adam. And this is the two graphs I got from from training at home. And you can see that we started overfitting around about here, and that's where I stopped the model. And we had an accuracy of around about 86% by that stage. I limited the number of images, um, and that that played a part. And you can see the same with the error. It's more it's more amplified when you look at the error graph. The error graph quickly moves away from from the training set. Okay, so your graph is only as good as it as it performs against an unseen test set. So the test set. Um, so we will be loading the model here. Of, yeah, it's an 86% accuracy model. And let's see how we've performed. This was also a lot quicker last night. Okay. Okay. So we made a couple of mistakes, but overall not too bad. I would not be too unhappy if you call this fluff ball a cat. Um, but it was actually a mistake. It's actually a doggy. This one could also go get through as a cat, but. Um, but does it start to make sense? The, your, 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 your scary big dogs, we got them all right. And the ones that, you know, you can see where the overlap is. And that will take a little bit more training. It will mean we, we need to pass the rest of our training examples through the model. And if you pass eno enough examples through it, we, you can actually get rid of all these mistakes and you can get to a, to a um, classification rate of around 97. 97% and not just 86% as in my case. Okay, thank you for for affording me opportunity. Thank you for showing me, uh, letting me show you that you can build a near, um, deep learning neural network and all of this without understanding math, without a math PhD. Hello? Yes, thank you very much, Therese, for your talk. Uh, we have some time for questions. Can I have a volunteer for running around with a microphone, especially near the back? Volunteer, responsible person. Where's the microphone? Here. Thank you very much. Uh, questions, put up your hand if you have a question. Thanks, Therese. Um, my question is, um, I have a few, um, but what was the what was the three in your image shape? What did the three represent? The the three is the depth of your image, so it's your RGB values, oh your yes, red, sorry. green, blue. Yes. Perfect. Thanks. Um, then on your test and training data, like what percentage of your test or of your of your of your data would you keep as out of sample for validation? I I kept them um, in when I actually did the training. I kept fifteen percent out, and I split them fifty fifty between a validation set and a tra and a test set. Awesome. Okay, cool. I see. And then last question is, um, I, I see a lot of deep learning examples uh, with image data sets. Is there another domain where deep learning is useful? Um, yeah, that's actually, it's actually a, an, a good question because images just make for good presentations. It just looks good. It's, it's great. But no, um, at work we actually use, we analyze, we do feature extraction on, on, on signals, which is only 2D and not... 3D or sorry, 1D and not 2D as in a case with images, and it works really well. So instead of having a 128 by 128, we've got one by uh, 700 um, signals that we pass through through our deep learning models, and it, and it works well. Yeah. More questions? There we go. Um, I'm interested to hear. Uh, 
following on from his question, what um, what is that signal processing? What is the kind of the use case for that? If we can get into that, because it okay. is an interesting thought. Is <laughs> what else can we apply this to? Okay, so so our use case is um, I work for a vehicle tracking company, and so our use case is using the acceleration data. So it's your it's the data that comes from accelerometer, and we typically whenever there's an incident that that breaches what that gets through a threshold, we we buffer about seven seconds worth of acceleration data um, at 100 hertz. So we've got 700 X Y Z. Um, it's a signal, and we do we do extraction on that to be able to classify whether it was an accident, the severity, and maybe if it was just a speed dump or, or something like that. Yeah. So that's one use case. Yes. Okay. So um, this is a bit of a new question. When you talked about overfitting, what does it imply? And I didn't. I couldn't spot the obvious reason it was overfitting on the graph. Could you just explain a bit more as to what overfitting was and how it dealt with that uh, graph that you did? Uh, okay, so so overfitting in, in, in our case, in this example case, is because I, I used a very small part of the data set. I only used 5,000 images. And what overfitting does in deep learning is it literally just maps the input images. And when you run your validation set through it, it's actually really poor. So you realize that it's, it hasn't learned anything. All it's done, it's just mapped to the training set. Uh, does that answer your question? Um, um, yeah, it's, very, it's, it's actually very clear. The moment, the moment in both your accuracy and your loss, when your validation line and your training line starts to move apart, then you, that's how you identify it. Yeah. So as long as, as, long as your um, accuracy is close to your validation line when you do, you know you're learning because your your training is not done against your validation set. It's only done against training. So you know you keep on learning, keep on learning, and then at some point it it splits and you know you stopped learning. Um, okay. Okay, so if you've got a scenario where you, you're across your data set, you've, for instance, say, got a, a million records of one type but only a hundred records of another, but you want to be able to identify those hundred records um, through, a, through a deep learning network. What's the best training approach for that, where you've got a very, very skewed set? Um, that, that is a difficult, that's a difficult scenario. Typically, a hundred images or type of, of a type of data is not enough to train a deep learning model. Um, in, that's, in that case, what you could do is you try and augment your data and maybe try and get it to 400 um, by, by swapping or inverse your, some of your data using some cropping, using some shifts in, in color and, and that sort of thing. Um, but yeah, your, your model will be able to handle it. So your model will be able to, to train. But your accuracy won't mean much. If it, if it makes sense, you will have to draw up a, a, a confusion matrix to see actually how well did you do specifically for that specific category because the accuracy you're going to see is going to be very high. It's going to be through the roof high because you're training for one type that's overwhel that over overwhelms your, your model and, a, and then a tiny part. Um, so your accuracy is going to look really good. Um, you will have to drill deep into your, into your um, results and look at specifically how well it's doing. Sometimes I, I've, got a, I've got a case where we've got about 1,500 um, per category for four of our categories, and one cate category we've only got 300 um, values. And it's just, it's just done well, so there's no need for us to do anything funny. It, 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 it's in line with the rest of the accuracy. But I can only see that by drilling into it and and setting up a confusion matrix or something like that. Yeah. Any more questions? Okay, as a, as a follow-up then, what if instead of 100 against 1 million, you have 4,000 against 40 million? You've got the same ratio, but a higher number in each category. Does that help? D deep learning is great at 40 million type um, problems. Um, typically, your your problems with a few thousand, you'll you, you you'll still use your traditional machine learning. Um, so yes, um, deep learning scales really well, 
And if you can get 4,000 of the one, I think you'll be actually okay, even though you've got 40 million of the other one, yeah. But so, so the problem is not the ratio. The problem is if you've only got a few hundred, you just don't have enough data to, to, to classify in that specific category. Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so you've spoken now about how deep learning scales really well uh, with the number of examples within a category, but how many categories do people typically use these networks for? Um, the ImageNet competition is done over a thousand categories and it uses about 1.2 million images and it, and it scales to an accuracy of about 97%. Yeah. So you can you can have really you can have a lot of categories, yeah. Any more questions? Anyone? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Luis. Again, uh, we we have a round of applause for our speaker.